So, good morning, and thank you very much for coming. And thank you for the introduction, Niels, and the compliments. Um, I got a major assignment first to talk about all birth cohort and challenges, and to be honest, I reduced that a bit to um, a theme that I've been working on much now, and that is neuroimaging in birth cohorts, and what does it tell us, what does it add us? So the theme is population neuroscience. Um, I'll start with a bit of what I try to sort of want to convey or get across um, and what I will focus on today. It'll be the prenatal exposures, as Niels has alluded to. And I added a theme for today because much of here is saying we're in development, in developmental uh, psychology, psychiatry, developmental science. So I want to try to tease that apart a bit and talk about time and timing two of my favorite concepts. And I'll try to introduce all the studies I'm talking about. It's about time, timing, or even both. And then I want to talk a bit about the impact. Uh, how does child psychiatric imaging, has it advanced the field of child psychiatry? Um, there's a great talk yesterday, a great keynote by Anita Tapar, and she talked about genetics gave an overview, which was brilliant. And then she always said, sort of, does it impact the clinical um, work, and she said, well, not really, not yet, we're not quite there, not in most cases, we have to be careful, and just remember that theme because you can carry it over to today. Um, brain imaging and child psychiatry. I'll give you one clinical example only because I just came from a session on psychotic experiences, which was wonderful actually, I think it was very, very good, and I'll tell you how we infused um, brain imaging in the psychotic experiences or psychotic-like experiences of adolescents. Just to start, and then I'll go to my public health topic. Um, so does brain imaging really help understand and predict the persistence, and you could say the incidence both, of uh, psychotic-like experiences in hallucinations? And much in line with what was just presented, we found about 20% of children at age 10 have some form of hallucinations of psychotic-like experience. Note that this is a very unspecific question, but the beauty of it is it's very simply assessed with, you know, do you hear voices, do you hear, do you see things other people don't see? Not just dreaming-like experiences, but really hearing voices. And that's up to 20%, and you think it's very, very high, but Irish studies and others have confirmed it. And then we show it goes down at age 14, there's some new cases and some persistence. And we studied 2,000 adolescents with imaging. I'll just show you the results and then I'll move on. We show that if you want to see who predicts, who con continues to have these um, psychotic-like experiences, which is a major relevant question, who you would think we can help predict with brain imaging, who continues to have these symptoms, the first thing we saw is essentially the whole brain lights up. Very aspecific if you have a bit less gray matter, a bit less brain volume that predicts that you will continue to have these symptoms. But the other side of that, a specific effect, it is tiny, it is very, very small. You can look at it with a sort of graph, and you can see if you take those with small brains and those with bigger brains, that's what the two lines here represent, then you can see that that does predict that if you have a smaller brain, you have about 10% chance, if you have a somewhat bigger brain, and that's, I told you, I'm sad to say it's A-specific, then you have somewhat lower chance. You know, we found it very exciting because we imaged 2,000 children, we followed them over time, we actually repeated the imaging, we did all our best to really predict. We, found, we looked at the hippocampus, it does predict, but it does like everything else, just a tiny bit of more persistence if the hippocampus is smaller. So essentially, although exciting the data set, I say, I can't see any any clinical application. It will not be that you will have a child with psychotic-like symptoms in your practice when he's age 10 and try to do a brain image. And then we can argue a long time, I won't do that, whether we should have more, more symptoms assessed, a better assessment, whether these are too A-specific. I'll just move on. I want to tell you about population neuroscience today, which is the intersection um, of epidemiology and imaging with the goal to inform public health and clinical practice. And I want to focus these examples, otherwise it becomes too big, on largely prenatal exposures. So exposures could be to environmental chemicals, I'll come to that, 
but also to psychosocial stresses like poverty or maternal depression. And we look at you know, development by and large, and sometimes we look at cognitive development or psychiatric problems. So can we, is the first question, identify intrauterine influences on child development for maternal child health practice or public health? And in Generation R, as Niels alluded to, we've studied a lot of um, risk factors prenatally. I can't do all of them. I'll focus, and in this order, on those in bold, which is depression, antidepressants during intrauterine phase, that's antidepressant use, poverty, thyroid, and I'll do some environmental exposures. Just one slide, really, or very few slides, on the study that the cohort that much of this is situated, Generation R, is a prospective cohort. It studied early in life, that is, prenatally. We nearly managed to include 10,000 women. It's a multi-ethnic um, multi urban cohort, which is important, and the baseline response was 62% was very good. We won't reach that anymore, so most of our cohorts are down to 30% now. Not much on the assessments. Perhaps you should look at with me. Not, we did many, many assessments, questionnaires, bloods, ultrasounds. I'll talk about some of them, specific develop, motor developments. We did all these things. But I want you to just focus on the magnetic resonance imaging, the MRIs. It was one of the first population-based studies. We managed to scan 1,000 children aged 7 to 8. We scanned 4,000 of this cohort of 10,000, as I told you, from 9 to 10, and we've scarred, scanned about 3,000, that's somewhat less due to COVID and braces, um, when they were 13, and the ongoing 17 wave is financed, and we'll add hopefully another 3,000. This means it's one of the largest cohorts in this aspect, in this so imaging cohorts, and has a good, nice follow-up. And I can show you how we use the repeated measures. But first, I'll focus part of the talk on the largest wave at age 10. There were 4,000 that we imaged. So, the first topic, maternal depression. And I'll stay with that topic for a while. Maternal depression during pregnancy, maternal depression just after birth of the child, and maternal depression during childhood. And the question is, how are maternal depressive symptoms from fetal life forward related to brain development of the child at age 10 years? So all the imaging in this study is at age 10. We relate the depression during pregnancy, early in life, and later, I'll show you here, to the brain imaging at age 10. So these are the assessments of depression of the mother during pregnancy, just after she gave birth, in childhood, and at the same time of the imaging, when the child is older. And the question arises, when are the effects of maternal depression on the brain development of the child the biggest? This is a question of timing, of sensitive periods. Could you give me some water? Yeah. Thank you. OK. Well, perhaps I should have said, think when the effect is biggest. Make up your mind whether you think a good candidate would be prenatally or just after birth. If you get, went to the other lecture of Feldman, you might think just after birth. You might think it's important during childhood, which covers a long developmental period, or cross-sectionally. Thank you. Well, I'll be brief. I can tell you just a lot of results, but just if you want to cheat for now, just look at the p-values. It's quite easy. And we take a very global approach. But we can, you know, with white matter, which is all the half of the brain, which is white matter, and then there's gray matter. And we can go to more detailed, but we won't do that for now. We'll just see where the effect is biggest. We imaged always more than 2,000 of these children that had been uh, prenatally assessed for depression, so at 20 weeks, at two months, at three years, at nine years, and nine to 10 years, and we see there's only an effect, actually, on the gray matter at two months. So we found no intrauterine effect after adjusting for confounders. We only found it early postnatally. So that is an effect of timing. 
quite relevant to understand brain development and possibly consequences for the behavior of the child. We found the most important effect is really this two months. That would be the easy answer if you take them all repeatedly, these assessments. We'll also look at, in a minute, at the different tracts. So this was just a very crude analysis of the volume of the white matter. If we move on, we can analyze the different tracts of the brain to get a more specific effect. And then if you see that, you see the same picture again. So the global tracts, and you see the same picture with other specific tracts of the white matter, which connect the different parts of the brain, so give the signaling sort of the tracts of the brain, and we see that the effect is two months of pregnancy. And there is some critique on this. You could say it's a chance finding, it could be anything else. But most importantly, we did not really account that these mothers have, are the same mothers and have repeated measures. So another analysis is possible. It's analysis of trajectories. And note, these are very important trajectories to understand these results. Why are they so important? It shows that there is a group of mothers that, it's not such a big group, but it's more than 3%, that has very high symptoms clinically all the time, always above the clinical cutoff. And interestingly, these mothers, just postnatally, when we see the biggest effects on the brain, have a spike in their symptoms. So actually, this spike carries the signal. Essentially, what we're imaging is really a group of mothers that always has high symptoms. You see that most mothers have mostly always low symptoms. Some have some symptoms. Some actually have very little symptoms, but when the child gets older, they develop their depressive symptoms. But there's this important clinical group, and you will see on the next slide that this high group, which goes down a bit, that group carries the whole effect. So actually, to looking at the individual episodes during pregnancy is actually probably the wrong approach. We should look at types of women, types of these trajectories, and then we see we can explain these results much better with these profiles that I showed you. So what I'm telling you now is that actually this is an artifact of that some women who always have high symptoms go up. That is the message. So really beware of, you can say it's timing, but really it's the course of these women that they are high. So essentially, epidemiologically, you can call it carryover effects, that the exposure of depression can't be separated in periods that most women have quite continuous episodes. And if you model it properly, you cannot distinguish the timing. You cannot distinguish the timing, is what I'm trying to tell you. It looks so nice, but you cannot do it. I'll do you another, beware, be, be with me, beware, another approach to depression. Just finished, very recent work. Maternal depression and prenatal SSRI use. And now it's about time since exposure. So where I had timing, now it becomes time since exposure. I'll tell you the question in a different way. The question really is, we see all these effects of depression and SSRI use, in this case, SSRI use, you will know, is antidepressants, commonly used in the Netherlands, 2% in America, up to 8% of pregnant women using antidepressants during pregnancy. There's been a lot of debate, very good Scandinavian studies, showing there's a small increase, perhaps, for autism, not very consistent if you look at sibling studies, but there is some association. We found it with birth outcomes. And the question that we always had in generation are, do these prenatal effects, do they stay for the rest of your life? In essence, in this audience, you're between, I would say, 25 and 55. Do the effects of your own interuterine life, do they still persist to this day? Or do they, you know, fade out? That's the real question. Because otherwise, are we, essentially, are we doomed? And now we've got these repeated imaging measures. We can revisit this and say, what happens? I'll show you. OK, this is a complicated slide with many contrasting exposures. Actually, I'll move it on to zoom on something a bit more easy. It's again, perhaps the one thing to note, it's again about these white matter connections. That's it. We're talking about these white matter connections. And now we're talking about whether interuterine exposure to SSRIs or to prenatal depression. These are two different groups. This is a small group. This is quite a huge group with many scans. So, and then there's a group that had neither depression 
nor SSR use, which we compared to, and we had, again, quite a few repeated scans over time. And if we take the seven-year-old, the earliest scans, we see the following. We see that both and very similar SSRI use and antidepressants show an effect on these white matter tracts. And even if you look at the different tracts, they all have the same picture. And these two groups are actually wonderfully similar. Even this one tract, the forceps minor, which sort of is next to the corpus callosum, if you wish, has a very <coughs> nice similar pattern. So in these very different people, we see an association at se seven years on the child's brain with less white matter tracts in the groups that have been exposed to prenatal maternal depression and the group that has been exposed to SSRIs. Are you with me? I hope you are. Okay. So, <laughs> it's complicated, but that's how it is. Now we want to know, okay, we image them at seven, we image them at nine, we image them at 13. What happens to these associations when we follow it longer? And then, I know it's complicated, you see this is the same pattern, you see, just look at the red, the spider plot, you can look at the whole brain or whatever you care about, but you see a difference from the spider plot, from these colors, so these, uh, these let's take the prenatal SSI exposure, the green, it's much smaller white matter at age seven. You've seen that before, but then we see that at age nine, but then comes the thing, when they are age 13 and 15, these differences disappear. They really disappear. Both the effects of depression, antenatal depression, and SSRI use disappear. Or, if you like this presentation better, you can see this was the white matter, this was the white matter, now we go to the structure, and we see the amygdala size was smaller in those exposed to SSRIs, but they catch up nicely in this period from 8 to 14. We measured repeatedly the amygdala, and we see it catches up to all the other groups, which is the reference group in red, or the SSRI, prenatal exposure, or postnatal exposure, it doesn't matter. They normalize and get to the same. A bit of a different picture is the hippocampus, where we see the smaller hippocampus. It gets a bit better, but it does persist. So the story is, it really depends on when the mother is depressed, but it also depends on when you assess the child. And if more time goes by, effects get smaller. This is a way to dissect what we always call as development into timing, which period, and time since exposure. And the problem is that we sometimes see effects. So if you want just you know, a very good publishable effect, you go to the seven-year-olds and then you publish. There is a big effect. If you, however, move it on, I'm trying to tell you the effects. Think of the amygdala. Perhaps this is the easiest slide. It just disappears. So this is the importance of things. And it actually makes sense that once we get into adolescence, some of these, some of these intrauterine exposures, which are actually quite small, disappear. And I would argue, I would really argue, this is clinically relevant, because it shows there is likely little long-term effect on the brain development of prenatal SSRIs. There may be some when you're young, we may see it. We actually see it in the registry stages from Scandinavia, that the effects are very small. They haven't shown a longer follow-up, but I would postulate that again they see the same picture, it disappears. And then there is a dilution of effects with age. Probably we speculate amygdala is one of the regions where there is neuroplasticity, there is catch-up growth. Okay, I want to show you some other data. I'm good with time, so I'll show you poverty, how that impacts brain. And it gets even more complicated, because what I'm trying to do is I'm sticking with the timing, but I'm saying that may interact with social factors. And poverty is sort of the preeminent social factor, if you wish. Okay, so what do we know? Household income has been associated with brain morphological changes. But no study has assessed household income in different periods of life. So we assess it in childhood and we assess it in prenatal life. And the question is, does low income affect brain morphology? And what I was interested in here is that the same across different groups of society. So this is a public health talk, but it has relevance for child psychiatry. Just to let you know about the different 
groups. So about half of the participants in the Generation R study are of Dutch national origin. About 10% are other European countries, and we can sort of cluster them together, thinking that these expats and people who move for work have the same genetic and social status. And that leaves a big group in this study of those that reflects colonial and migration. So workers who come as guest workers and then stay and acculturate to the Dutch society. These are Moroccans and Turkish people, and largely in the Netherlands. And we've got 2,000 children. I told you we have, that's what whom we image is, where we have assessment of poverty um, based on the national income threshold in the Netherlands. And how do we look at this data? Well, we could say there are those that have never been poor and those that have been poor at any one time, at any one time. It's about 20% of our population that has clear poverty below a stringent threshold. So 20% experience poverty either during um, pregnancy or during childhood, or both. And what you also see is, of those of the population in general, 80% here that participated in the study, so we have some selection bias, is of Dutch, Dutch national origin, or we take actually Dutch and European national origin, and 20% is not. And you see that the poverty is really not the same distribution. Of those that are poor, only 25% or 26% are Dutch. Most of the poor are actually of non-Dutch origin. And you see a similar distribution. You can also look at the different timings of poverty exposure only in pregnancy and only in childhood. And those that have pregnancy plus childhood is the biggest group, those that remain poor. But it allows you, these numbers allow you to distinguish childhood and pregnancy. Okay, and then you've got all these different measures and, you know, we can look at I like to look at these global volumes first and then zoom in on the smaller volumes, but you actually see the same picture, which essentially with all these different groups means nothing much. There is no strong, consistent association. If anything, there was something with the amygdala, which surprised us, because the amygdala you know, and you've heard many talks here, and even if you don't know much, you have an idea where it is, and it's sort of stress-related or fear-related. It does some of the fear memory. You may know that. And there, in this group, we see that both the group that sees it ever low, and then the groups in particular, that is the group in pregnancy only, and the chronic income, which also includes pregnancy, those had lower amygdala volume. You can make a story. Actually, if you stringently control for multiple testing, it becomes very borderline. And here is just so that you know, this is a amygdala is a bit bigger than the hippocampus, but still a small area of the brain. And then you see one thing. We now looked at just the Dutch national origin. And actually, if you focus in on the biggest group, those that are of Dutch origin, you see very global effects. You see effects that the total brain or the total white matter is, oops, sorry, I apologize, is smaller. So what you see is, in particular, those, that's the big group that was poor in childhood in the Dutch, those develop, they have smaller brains. Whether that is stress, whether that's genetics, whether that is whatever, uh, we don't know. But we know that poverty is associated with poorer brain development, in particular in the white group when it is during childhood. We see a very different picture in the non-Dutch. So this is only the 500, quite a big group, of people who are a minority in the Netherlands. A minority defined by national status, closely related to poverty. And what we see here is actually no effect on any of the bigger brain measures. But we see a very, very strong effect, certainly if we pool this, the pregnancy together, and the sort of always poor, including pregnancy, if we put that together, we see a very strong, significant effect in the minority groups on the amygdala, actually explaining nearly the overall effect. It is the poor non-Dutch where the amygdala is smaller developed. And why could that be? Actually, we did a follow-up analysis. This is another follow-up analysis in the Dutch side, jumping. This is the wrong way of slide, or I apologize, trying to say that 
you always say he looks at the brain only. Here's a slide where we look at school performance. So we look at how this low income and poverty relates to the total brain. It does. I showed you this overall white matter effect. And actually, that relates, relates to poorer school performance. Those in the Dutch, there's a national test called the CETO, which is a national 11-year-old academic test to go to higher schooling. We show lower performance on this test. And it's explained by these smaller brain volumes. So we see that poverty not only affects the brain, it also has a relevance for your school performance. And then I want to come to the summary slide. First of all, poverty has an effect on brain development. It differs how majority and minority are affected. And then this smaller brain volume partly explains the school performance. But what is perhaps most important is there's a distinct mechanism we must discuss that in minority groups. And actually, we showed in additional analysis that part of this effect in the minority group, in the non-Dutch group, that we see between the amygdala can be explained by reported discrimination. So when we correct or adjust for discrimination, the effects get quite a bit smaller, explaining likely why the poverty plus discrimination makes people stressed during pregnancy which then could explain why the amygdala develop less optimally. OK, I told you it's a roller coaster ride in time and timing. And this was timing plus social factors. Here is, I think, what we found. I was asked to talk about highlights of my work, highlights of timing. So bear with me. We're going to something which is, for some of you, very exotic, the thyroid function. Let's talk about the maternal thyroid function during pregnancy. You think, who cares about the thyroid function? Well, you might know that evolution is quite conservative. It uses the same systems for different things in different periods of your life. And you must realize that the thyroid system, which is sort of an energy metabolizing hormone, is somewhat related to psychiatry even in adults, but in prenatal life, it has a very different function. Actually, it guides how the neurons migrate during embryonic life from the inner ventricular layer to the cortex. That is guided by thyroids. Essentially, the brain development of the embryo depends on the availability of thyroid hormone of the mother. OK, that mini course in physiology, maternal thyroid hormones, neuronal or neural migration, and neurogenesis is driven. And importantly, up to week 14, 16, we know from rat work and other work, even in humans, the embryo and later the fetus depends for quite a bit on the availability of maternal thyroid hormones. OK, you got that. And then the child develops the thyroid of the child kicks in. Why is this important? It's important for many things. It means that we have to supplement or make sure that the mother has good thyroid function, not even only clinical thyroid problems, but actually just variation within the norm of the mother can affect probably neurodevelopment. So it's a very tightly regulated, you don't want to have too much, you don't want to have too little, but you need it for your child. And actually, you need more thyroid and thus more, for example, iodine during pregnancy to have a good child development. So that's the background of this study, which makes it fascinating to study the timing. Um, let me just start with the first thing we started many years ago, just as a sort of starter, to relate this to autistic symptoms. So social responsiveness scale is a measure of autistic symptoms. And what we see is that those that have severe hypothyroxemia, that means the mother has somewhat low, but this is quite, you know, it's 5% of the mothers have this, somewhat low thyroid levels in the blood. And you see in those children, they have more autistic symptoms, both boys and girls. So, Low thyroid levels of the mother early during pregnancy are related to more thyroid symptoms, uh, autistic symptoms. That was known. And then we did the following. We looked at IQ. 
And with this IQ, better than with an autistic measure, because with IQ we get high and low very well defined, sort of low and very low autistic symptoms doesn't matter, but you get very high and low, you get very good measures, and then we get the thyroid levels, this is the thyroid hormone. Just see, this means low thyroid hormones of the mother. This means high thyroid hormones of the mother. And what you then see is what we call an inverted U-shape. So it means that very low symptoms are bad for the IQ. You lose two or three points. And you think very high symptoms, very high levels are also bad. And then one thing about effect sizes, you know, I don't normally comment on effect sizes, but here effect sizes become very clear. You know, you'd think optimal is 103, less optimal is perhaps 99.5, let's say 100. So it boils down to three IQ points. Well, you could say, who cares about three IQ points in the child? Well, if I were able to sell three IQ points, quite a few of you would line up to, I would say, 100,000 for three IQ points in your child, you would pay it, quite a few. Not all of you, but some would take a mortgage to have three IQ points, because it's only five IQ points difference between the high success children and the low success children on average. It's not only driven by IQ, you'd be surprised, but it's actually quite important to have, you know, the difference between the brightest in the room and the not so brightest in the room will not be that many points either, so don't overestimate yourself. So three points, three points are quite an effect, although I admit it's not, you know. Okay, so nicely hovering around the average. You can see it's a bit better if you have more thyroid, but it matters. This is a wonderfully clear figure. I'll show you the same. In another study we replicated, so it's not only generational, this is the one slide that we do work elsewhere. It's an LSPEC study, you all know of that, and a very nice Spanish study. And we show the same relation, well, I think it's the same. This of high thyroid is not so clear, but the low thyroid IQ relationship is extremely robust across cohorts in, and been replicated many more times. So now we change from, I must admit one thing now, we're changing from the thyroid hormone, I'll just go back because you didn't notice that, on this axis is the thyroid hormone. On this axis actually is the thyroid stimulating hormone. I don't want to do physiology here, but actually it means the stimulating hormone is inversely related to the thyroid hormone, which means you have to essentially flip the x-axis. Even if you're not with me, believe me, it just means that this is now high thyroid function, and this is low thyroid function. Another way of saying that, you want to stimulate the thyroid axis because it's low. So that's just the other way. But you see the same, same inverted U-shaped curve, and you see that was 9, 10 years, and that was any time during pregnancy we measured it in relation to the brain. So we see corresponding to, corresponding to the IQ, we see gray matter associations, okay? So it's a, the relation between poor thyroid function is consistent whether we look at IQ or whether you look at the brain, which is another quite wonderful thing. And again, you could argue whether this shape is exactly the same. Trust me, that's not what it's about now. It's just that there is this inverse U-shaped association. And now I want to come to timing in pregnancy. So whereas before we always said pregnancy is one period, we're now zooming in on the different weeks of gestation during pregnancy. So I'm making the timing even more specific, namely, when in pregnancy do we measure the thyroid hormone? And remember, if we go late in pregnancy, the child hormones, the child thyroid hormones matters early in pregnancy. It's the mother's childhood. That gives us a wonderful opportunity to zoom in on timing, because it matters. And then I'll show you Gestational age at thyroid assessment, does, is that, you know, does that say something about sensitive periods? And this is as good as it gets with my timing story. So we measured some as early in pregnancy as week seven. You know, some women don't even know that they're pregnant at week seven. Others were already participating in Generation R. They've had signed consent, team lined up, and wanted their ultrasound, which is quite astonishing. And importantly for this study, given us their blood. And then you see, we see this wonderfully clear association between the brain 
and the level of thyroid hormone. So we see what we've seen before. This, was the, this is the TSH, so essentially this would be low levels, this would be high levels, so low levels are really strongly associated with less um, grey matter. Same grey matter volume, you can actually sort of see how much centimetres three the children have less. And we see that same association, but then note, sort of this wears off. We come to week 14, 15, 16, when the child's thyroid kicks in and the association essentially disappears. What that means is two things. What does it mean? That's very important. It means that there is, if we get the right timing of the assessment, we can see the function. We cannot see it here anymore. The only problem of my wonderful timing slide here is that there's two interpretations. One is thyroid hormones don't matter anymore. And the other interpretation is measuring the mother's thyroid hormone at week, what is it, 18, does not matter anymore because you should have measured the child's thyroid hormone, which really does the job. So it can be either a sensitive period for the effect or essentially only a sensitive period for the measurement. I don't know, even if it's beautiful, it doesn't get you there. Okay, so there are sensitive periods, but we don't know if that reflects an overall thyroid dependency of the brain or just that you cannot rely on maternal thyroid hormone anymore. And these are really nicely, you know, we had different people in different weeks and we met, imaged all their offspring brains later and still we can't say much more that, you know, maternal thyroid measures in week 18 are not informative anymore. So it has major clinical and research implications because it means one thing, Interventions must start early because either you have no effect with your thyroid hormone on the child brain anymore by supplementing, or it means you cannot detect validly those that have low thyroid levels. And actually it has very important implications because all the trials, and that is important, supplemented in week 14. So assess mothers in week 14. No randomized trial has been able to assess and include women in a pregnancy trial at week seven because the procedure of assessment, referral, and starting treatment, consenting, takes too long. So what we're doing is we're always assessing here and then we're seeing we see no effect because we might treat the wrong people. It has major, not so much understanding um, biology, but it has major how we do research implications, I would argue. And I'll do one more, I think I can do one more, uh, topic with you, getting even more complicated about my time. I'll take you how I combine um, brain growth over time and calendar time. You think, calendar time? Isn't it the same as time? No, it's not. I'll show you. And the other thing is, do you know anything about trans fatty acids? I warned you, highlights are in the margin of research, and I'll tell you why they are in the margin of research. Um, okay, you'd, the question was, what do you know about trans fatty acids? And if I would have more time and this room would not be so big, I would sort of interact with the audience and find somebody who's heard in his previous life on trans fatty acids. Okay, it's true story is, I come from a baker's family and I always cared about trans fatty acids. It's um, trans fatty acids, so we know you, you, in Scandinavia, people have heard, and most of Europe now, about PUFAs and 3-omega and 6-omega fatty acids, okay? Those are the naturally occurring fatty acids which are essential in our body. But there's also industrially produced fatty acids. These are not natural fatty acids. They are byproducts of the way we make industrial fats. Trans fatty acids, chemically different. Trans fatty acids. So the classical ones, the cis, both the omega-3 and 6 are cis fatty acids, but there's also trans fatty acids. And interestingly, in the 1980s, there was a movement to replace butter with margarine. Okay, you might remember, you might have heard, or you might infer that there was a time when everybody was eating butter, and then there was a time when people started eating margarine. Actually, the number one margarine eaters in the Europe were the Dutch, partly because they had Unilever and they marketed the margarine. And actually, in the 80s, we noticed that there was a lot of trans fatty acids in the margarine and all oil products. And these have been related in the 90s to cardiovascular poor health very convincingly, dramatically. 
dramatically associated to poor cardiovascular health. And it's interesting because I read this up when I started to study this. It's the Danish, so this is not made up for this talk, it was the Danish that were the, one of the first to ban trans fatty acids in oil products. Importantly, the Danish, at that time there was no European you know, consensus policy, banned it. They said, we don't want it. It's quite easy, it makes oil a bit more expensive, but it's quite easy to get rid of it and to do it more careful so you get rid of these trans fatty acids. Interestingly, the can Dutch... You, can you, can sorry? Two minutes? Two minutes, I'll manage. Two minutes, I'll manage. Thanks, for Niels. I'll manage. I'll be quicker about my talk. The Dutch didn't ban it, they just said, please, industry, reduce production. And what happened is, the industry did reduce production. Unilever kicked it out, many others. And what you see is, this is the population data, you see that in these products, this went down, so the women and the general population had less trans fatty acids in blood. And now I'll rush you through the slides, it's just about the conclusion. But the interesting thing is, in the 2000s, at the time when the Dutch reduced the trans fatty acids, we included the children in Generation R. Exactly at that time. So, these two, and I have to steal you an extra minute, these two curves, this going down, and what we saw in the Netherlands in the Dutch pregnant women correspond in time. So by chance we had included the women in the time when the policy made this change in trans fatty acids which was related to poor cardiovascular and neurological outcomes. And then we can show that this corresponds, I'll rush you through it, you can't read the data anyway, this corresponds to head growth. I'm very excited about this, but it corresponds to the re uh, bigger heads in the children. So you can see an association of trans fatty acids with less head growth in utero as assessed by ultrasound. This is data from a few 6,000 children and their head growth measured in the third and second trimester, and it shows the association with the trans fatty acids. And actually, you can do, and we call that an instrumental variable analysis, which is a causal, a true causal analysis. You can use the calendar time to show an association between head growth, essentially showing that if you measure carefully the head growth of the children, is a bit bigger if you are born in 2007 than if you're born in 2003. And because that is hard to explain otherwise, and we shouldn't explain it otherwise, we relate it to the reduction of trans fatty acids, which is a causal instrumental variable. So the first time I've been able to do a causal analysis by using this calendar time as an instrumental variable, explaining the causality between the policy and the head size. And why is that so relevant? Because we have in many countries higher trans fatty acids to this day. They have not changed the policy. In the Netherlands, it's disappeared. In Denmark, it's banned. All West European countries have gotten rid of it, but it still exists and it is very bad. Okay, I want to end here, my last minute. I think brain imaging can unravel mechanisms. I hope I convinced you. I think it's not useful as a diagnostic or prognostic marker. I would, and you can falsify me, postulate that that will not change in the next 10 years. It will not, clinical utility will remain elusive. And public health relevance, well, you don't care about trans fatty acids, you don't care about fetal growth. So in that case, only occasionally will we find something really public health relevant. I would say very rarely will we find something clinically relevant. And that's it. One minute over time. I want to thank the <laughs> participants, my students. Thank you very much.